Carolyn Woodruff, Woodruff Family Law Group. And we're here today to talk about legislative redistricting. This is going to be a nonpartisan forum for educational purposes. So we have a lot of attendees. If you have questions, you'll notice a Q&A box. We will have questions and answers at the end. But so go as you think of a question, please put it in your Q&A box and we will uh, get to those as many of them as we can at the end. Also, um, please know that we have with us today the Honorable Don Vaughn, who I will introduce fully in just a moment, to talk about legislative updates. And we have Matthew Mengert to talk actually about redistricting and some of the case law that has been involved in redistricting. So. First, uh, I will want everybody in the chat box, if you are a member of the North Carolina Bar and you would like for us to apply for CLE credit, there's an applicant, we're pending to get, we're trying to get the CLE credit. You don't really know till they review your program, but if you, we need your state bar number. So put your state bar number in now at the, uh, in the chat box with your name and at the end, we will also have you put it in again to verify attendance for the whole uh, hour of CLE credit. Now, without much ado, let's go on to Don Vaughn, the Honorable Don Vaughn. Um, the recent thing that he's involved in is the North Carolina Bar Association Hall of Fame, which he will be inducted in at the annual meeting this summer. So we're all excited about that. Uh, the Honorable Don Vaughn has led the Guilford County delegation to the General Assembly of North Carolina. He served in the North Carolina Senate from 2008 to 2013. Academically, he's an adjunct professor of law at the Wake Forest University School of Law, where he teaches state and local government. Don has been the uh, Citizen Lawyer Award by the North Carolina Bar, Bar Association for his volunteer work. He served on the North Carolina Depart uh, Chamber of Commerce, the Greensboro Chamber of Commerce, the Greensboro Merchants Association, and many other civic organizations. Uh, Mr. Vaughn has served on the North Carolina Courts Commission and continues to serve on the State Banking Commission. He received the Distinguished Leadership Award from the North Carolina Institute of Political Leadership and the Order of the Longleaf Pine. John, uh, Don graduated from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill with highest honors in 74. He received a master's in public administration from American University and his law degree from Wake Forest University where he was a member of the Law Review. So, we will have Mr. Vaughn's presentation on the legislative update, and then uh, Mr. Vaughn will be introducing Matt, Matthew Mengert. So take it away, the Honorable Donald Vaughn. Well, Carolyn, I wish my mother were here to, uh, to hear those words at being pa right past Mother's Day weekend, and uh, thank you so much. Uh, my job today is to give an update on the North Carolina General Assembly. We are exactly this week at the halfway mark in a session that started in January and will end up in July. This week is crossover week, and this is the week that one bill must get from one house to the other or die. So we'll sort of know at the end of this week what kind of bills we're looking at. There have been about 3,000 filed, and we're gonna to touch on some of them today. Uh, Judy, next slide. So, yay, North Carolina legislative update, next slide. So, for all of y'all that have seen or expected to see Hamilton, one of the great lines that 
comes out of Alexander Hamilton is, is be in the room where it happens. And in North Carolina, that room is the North Carolina General Assembly. In the courses I teach on the legislature, I give out Burger King hats to all the students so they can see at the, when I teach the legislat legislative process that the legislature is the king. Next slide. This building is the North Carolina General Assembly. It is one of the most powerful legislative bodies in all 50 states. It's only one of 12 states that actually has uh, two chambers and a divided legislature with the governor and the bodies in the House and the Senate uh, 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 controlled by the other party. Next slide. All of this is governed, and most people don't even know we have one, by the state constitution. It establishes what we're going to talk about today. It establishes rights for citizens and the check and balance system over all the uh, uh, all these parties. Next slide. You have on your left the upper body, the Senate chamber that has 50 members. The House chamber has 120 members. And next slide. This is the partisan control of the Republicans over the Democrats, which is vitally important to the process. And it's gonna be vitally important what Matt Mingard is gonna say following my presentation. Over in the state Senate, Democratic Party has 22 seats. Republican Party has 28. Over on the House side, Democrats have 51 and Republicans have 69. So it is a very much a Republican controlled legislature, next slide, that has these two guys as in the leadership role. President Pro Tem Phil Berger that has Rockingham and some of Guilford. Tim Moore from Cleveland County, uh, uh, way down in the tip of North Carolina, down near South Carolina. Both have been reelected to leadership positions and very much control their, their bodies on uh, uh, important matters. Next slide. Jousting with them on many times is the man that's office is in the Capitol building. This is the state Capitol. Next slide. And the, the Honorable Roy Cooper is the governor. Now, as you know, if you wa have watched the news, he has been very busy on two main things during his term. One is COVID. And by most counts, he has done a good job on directing this state and getting us out of the worst pandemic in history. He has also been a, a governor that has worked on jobs and economic development. And he is now in his fifth year being governor. He has three and a half years left, and we're going to talk about his agenda and what bills that he is running through the other bodies. Next slide. His main tool in governing North Carolina is the budget, and this is the Go Governor Cooper's recommended budget for 2021 to 2023. In his words, it's strong, resilient, and ready. The Republican legislature has other ideas and they must approve this budget within the next few weeks. It'll be on the front page of every newspaper in, uh, in North Carolina. Next slide. I've, I've nailed it down to 10 issues that are the hot issues for this legislature. As you can see, guns and violence, infrastructure, broadband, education, which is higher education and, and uh, primary education, health care, economic development and jobs, marijuana, surprisingly enough, professional horse racing, can't make that up, and casinos and gambling. And then another issue impacts is making your voice heard 
as a citizen. And that is an important issue today that is going on. Next slide. Everyone knows what happened over in Minneapolis and what has happened in Elizabeth City in North Carolina, where a individual was shot in the back of the head by the police. This is one of the key items that's going to be discussed by the General Assembly. Now with this, technology has changed and the General Assembly is finally catching up to regulating technology. Body cams are a very, very hot issue right now. Cell phone technology, what can be used in court, what cannot be used, and they will be keying on this as one of the very uh, top issues that this session of the General Assembly will be remembered. With this, police tactics are coming under heavy scrutiny. North Carolina's criminal justice system will see a lot of reform based on what happened in Minneapolis, what has happened in other places around the country. What they're looking for is more transparency with police departments. And you can only turn to today's, this is the local newspaper here in Greensboro, to see the headline, city wants more police officers. City also wants raises for police officers that they, that they deserve. Minimum salary for a police officer is $40,000. Uh, and they want psychological testing for police officers. It is gonna be an overwhelming issue in this session. Most of the bills uh, on guns and violence will pass crossover, which is Thursday, and then go on to the other side for fleshing out. Probably Governor Cooper will sign all of those bills, but it's just at the wait and see point right now. Next slide. One of the big issues that's gonna come before the General Assembly is infrastructure. On the last report, national report on infrastructure, North Carolina got a C minus. Folk, our bridges are crumbling. 9.3% of the bridges in North Carolina need immediate repair. There are 1,307 dams that don't meet standards. Roads have got problems. We have a great road system. We've been known over the years as the good roads state, but we're gonna to have to spend some money to keep that up. We've been absolutely very fortunate in Greensboro to have I-73, I-74 coming through here, along with I-40, I-85. Now other parts of this state are not that fortunate. So there's gonna be a real key in this legislature on fixing what we have and infrastructure. Next slide. One of the things that COVID has taught us is we have good broadband in North Carolina. We've led the way, but we need broadband for everyone. With schools, kids being unable to attend schools, there are areas of North Carolina that still do not have broadband. This legislature will key on trying to service some of those areas that have not been done. And COVID has showed us that we need it. We need it for emergencies like this. We need to train our high school students on broadband, but there's a lot of areas that don't have it. And it'll be something you see a lot of. Next slide. Higher education. I know I've got a, a daughter that goes to the ever greater University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, that's why I picked this slide, that lives off of Franklin Street and has not been to a class all year. It's all been by broadband. And they're getting ready to go back to class. Hopefully it will be live in, in the fall. The legislature is gonna need to regulate that. Uh, we've, we've had a pause in higher education and hopefully we can get back into with students in the classroom as well as virtual. Next slide. High schools 
are the same way. Now, many of you that happen to be from Greensboro and Guilford County will recognize this slide. I picked the Grimsley Whirlies that has not won a state championship since 1960, and by golly, they won. Most of these kids are gonna be coming back next year to school. We're gonna to have to spend money to get them back in the classroom do many things. So, uh, as always, secondary and elementary education will be a high priority of the next General Assembly. Next slide. After COVID, we have seen our health care system needs reform. And the bills that are in the, in the General Assembly now, most of them deal with access to health care our smaller hospitals in North Carolina aren't there anymore. They also talk about, in, in many of the bills, transparency in billing, as well as the affordability of health care. It will be a very, very tough issue for the General Assembly and one to particularly watch. Next slide. A recent boost a great boost for North Carolina was Apple announcing their going to the Research Triangle Park with a billion dollar campus. I know everybody on this call has kept up with this, but they're gonna have 3,000 employees with an average wage of $185,000. It's gonna change the dynamic in North Carolina. We're fortunate that we have the infrastructure, we have roads in the Research Triangle Park area to accommodate this. There's gonna be a lot of questions regarding housing, other things. Some of these folk are gonna live in Greensboro, some are gonna live in Raleigh, Zebulon, other places, but it's gonna bring a brain trust to North Carolina that we haven't had before. Research Triangle was an invention in the 1950s, and it's really providing fruit today. Next slide. Other companies like Amazon now have locations through North Carolina. This slide was Monday of this week, announcing 500 new jobs to Johnston County. Amazon is great. We are looking forward to having them. There's going to be some challenges in the legislature, particularly to Amazon, to make, make, make sure they're able to deliver the products they have. And you're going to see a lot of bills there. Next slide. Believe it or not, the time may have come, and it's a shocker to many, that the legislature is talking about legalizing marijuana. I never thought in my days I'd ever see it, but the, the um, uh, Phil Berger this week said, public attitudes are changing. There are bills there for medical marijuana. And I just think you may see North Carolina take the leap that Virginia has, that Georgia has in medical marijuana and it's be something to watch. I never thought we'd ever see it in my lifetime, but this may be the session to have it. Next slide. Professional horse racing in North Carolina? That can't happen. Yes, there's talk in the legislature because of the revenue that it produces to have paramutual betting, off-track betting. Uh, it's mainly about revenue. And watch those bills. I never thought we would see it. I think you're going to see it. They've got an act in there called the North Carolina Derby Act that uh, talks about being able to do all these things. Something very interesting to watch. Next slide. The last thing on the fun side is casinos and gambling for North Carolina. With Danville, Virginia having a new $230 million casino we will now have the newest casino in North Carolina open way down in Cleveland County. Guys, it opens July 1 with a temporary headquarters. This will bring, rightly or wrongly, more money into North Carolina. 
the Cherokee uh, Casino up on the tip of the state has brought many results, a whole change in that economy up there. A lot of people oppose it. A lot of people are for it. It's something to watch. It's a changing North Carolina between horse racing, casinos. It, it's a changing environment there. Next slide. Now, if you want to know more about this, there's three, about 3,000 bills that have been introduced. I put up here a wonderful tool, which is the North Carolina General Assembly website. This one was from on Monday. Most of the committees, and North Carolina is really a based on a committee type system, can be accessed and you can hear them with audio or video all of the time. And this keeps anyone who has any interest in this at all up to date every day. It is a wonderful tool. It's not like the old days where you had to uh, be a magician to be able to find somebody live in the General Assembly. Uh, you can now see it online. Legislators will answer your questions online. We're finally into the 21st century. Next slide. There's one telephone number for the whole General Assembly. And most people don't know this. You may reach any legislator by dialing this number. You don't have to remember their particular number. 919-733-4241, which is the Capitol switchboard. And easy to do. And uh, they answer it um, in the morning, eight o'clock to eight o'clock at night. If you have questions on any of these bills and want to keep up more, just call that number. They will put you into the legislative library. They will send you reports. They're so happy to hear. And it's simple. It's one telephone number and you can reach everyone there. Next slide. So back as old Alex Hamilton said, be in the room where it happens. For too long, the General Assembly has been those folk way down in Raleigh making laws. With new technology and all that we have, it is the room where it happens. We're at halftime in the General Assembly. Carolyn, I know you're gonna sponsor another one of these at the end where we can talk more about what particularly has happened to our area, what the bills are, that are the new laws, and we'll look forward to it. Next slide. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce one smart guy, Matt Mingard. Matt Mingard is involved in Washington in redistricting. He is a graduate with honors from the Ever Greater University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he was the Terry Sanford Award winner in his expertise. He grew up right here. Uh, and uh, he is going to give the next presentation on redistricting, which is going to be the future of this legislature. Matt Mingard, I, uh, I send it over to you. Thank you, Don, and thank you, Carolyn, for, for having me as well. Both of you have been uh, extraordinary mentors to me as I have uh, developed my professional career. And just to, to stick on this, this map that we have up right now, this is a map that was enacted uh, following uh, some state court litigation challenging the uh, the old North Carolina congressional map. And this, this map came from a, a challenge on the basis of uh, the North Carolina state constitution, as Don was mentioning. And the, the district that currently covers Greensboro, District 6, which is represented by uh, Representative Kathy Banning, used to be a district uh, for, for several years that cut Greensboro in half and stretched through Davie County and uh, Davidson County, Iredell and Rowan counties. Um, that district uh, looked like a lot of the gerrymanders that we have seen in North Carolina in that it cut Greensboro in half, effectively diluting the influence of voters in uh, Greensboro. The old district used to uh, used to cut the North Carolina A&T State University's campus in half, uh, which was an extraordinary thing to do given uh, the, the historical and, uh, you know, the successes that we've seen out of that university and the people that have attended it and, and taught there. 
Um, so to talk a little bit about the census a little bit and to back up and talk about something else that's gonna change in North Carolina is that we as a state have gained a 14th congressional seat. Uh, the Census Bureau two weeks ago announced the population totals of the entire country and the population totals of each individual state. And on the basis of those, they apportion the 435 congressional districts to the states. So North Carolina had a population growth of about a million people, about 10% from nine and a half million to about 10 and a half million. And uh, with that, with the relative growth, uh, it is now the ninth most populous state in the country and received a, an additional congressional district. So before the 2022 elections, uh, the General Assembly will have to draw new congressional and state legislative maps. Uh, they have to do that for a number of reasons. In the North Carolina Constitution, the General Assembly is required in its first session after the, uh, the delivery of census data to uh, redraw the state legislative districts, so the state house and the state senate districts. And um, so they will do that. And those districts have to be equally populated, but have a little bit more of a degree of deviation that's acceptable uh, than the congressional districts. The congressional districts have to be uh, as nearly equal as possible. And that generally tends to mean that if it's not possible to make every district uh, the exact same population, the deviations tend to be uh, just one or two people. And that's where we get the one person, one vote principle from. So currently, with the new census numbers that we received a few weeks ago, we now know, as was easily predictable, that the, the current districts, which are equally populated based on the 2010 census, are no longer equally populated. So those districts will have to be redrawn. The Census Bureau and the, the, the 2020 census enumeration process has been uh, delayed and disrupted for a number of reasons. Uh, and this is an extraordinarily unprecedented census in that the, uh, the 2020 or the 2019 COVID pandemic delayed the enumeration process, the actual door knocking and some of the follow-up responses that are required to, to, uh, to fulfill the constitutionally mandated uh, total enumeration of the, of, the, of the country's population. And as well, on top of that, there have been a number of political disruptions trying to add a citizenship question to the 2020 census, which was ultimately rejected by the Supreme Court. And as a result, the a citizenship question was not on the 2020 census questionnaire. Uh, and then uh, in 2019, the Trump administration announced that they intended to exclude undocumented residents from the apportionment counts. So had that been the, the practice of the administration, they would have taken the numbers we received two weeks ago and removed based on administrative records that they had, the, the undocumented residents from the states and then apportioned the number of congressional seats to each state based on that new number. Um, the, you know, kind of the fundamental bedrock principle of representation in the country is to count everyone and, and to divide the districts based off of that. So that would have been an extreme departure from you know, historical practice. That ultimately was not the case. And um, the, 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 the seats were apportioned based on total population of the states uh, as, as uh, shown from the 2020 census uh, numbers. Now, the delays in the census not only caused a, a four-month delay in the, in the delivery of those apportionment numbers, but it's also caused a six-month delay in the delivery of redistricting data. So the data that we received from the Census Bureau a few weeks ago shows us uh, very little in terms of actually drawing uh, legislative and congressional district lines. It doesn't, the data is not down to the political subdivision that you have to have to actually draw the districts. That data will not be available until August or September. And there is current litigation that is trying to kind of push forward the delivery of that data. But the Bureau, as of right now, has announced that it expects by no later than September 30th to deliver data to the states uh, necessary to redraw state legislative and congressional lines. Now, most states 
will draw their their congressional and state legislative lines during the sessions that are currently happening right now. Some of them have already concluded. Uh, states normally receive their data between February and April, and they will they will draw their lines during those uh, sessions. Now, with the with the delayed receipt of the data, many states will be faced with a situation where they where they will either have missed deadlines to draw their districts, or they will have to call special sessions, or they will have to uh, extend their legislative session. Um, so that has caused quite a uh, quite a disruption in state's normal process of the kind of decennial redistricting process that they normally do during this current legislative session. Um, I'm going to talk now a little bit about the, uh, the, the past decade of litigation in North Carolina over both the state legislative lines and the congressional lines. And this litigation has been in both federal court and in state court. Uh, the, the state legislative lines and the congressional lines that were drawn in 2010 um, by the Republican-controlled General Assembly uh, were found to be uh, racial gerrymanders, uh, clusters of the state legislative nines, not the, to, not the entirety of the map. And in, in, on the congressional map, the, the first congressional district in the northeastern part of the state and the 12th congressional district were found to be uh, impermissible racial gerrymanders, uh, violation of the United States Constitution. When the when the legislature reconvened and redrew the lines that had been found to be racially gerrymandered, they replaced them with what we consider partisan gerrymanders. And um, it was actually the express intent of the of the legislature to do that. They, they, they made it clear in the congressional map that they wanted to replace the 10-3, the 10 Republican district, three Democratic district map with a new map that was maintained that political divide of 10-3. And on the floor, one of the, one of the members said that they were gonna do that because they didn't think it was possible to draw a map that created 11 Republican districts and two Democratic districts. The, uh, the, of course, the, the gerrymandering on the state legislative level is, is uh, particularly harmful to voters' ability to elect candidates of their choice and to be able to exert their political influence, uh, even with a high turnout and high vote share because of the way that voters are packed into districts so that they are solidly blue or solidly red, leaving, leaving little room for competitive districts. And, uh, and, and so the, the state legislative maps were challenged in following the 2018 uh, elections, were challenged as impermissible partisan gerrymanders under the North Carolina Constitution in a case called Common Cause v. Lewis. Um, in that case, the, the, um, the court issued a 350 page opinion finding that those districts did violate the state constitution on several grounds. One, they said that partisan gerrymandering strikes at the heart of the free elections clause, which states that all elections shall be free. There is no federal counterpart to that clause in our state constitutions that says all elections shall be free. And the, the, the court also said that partisan gerrymandering violates the, the state's equal protection clause. Uh, which has been interpreted to include the fundamental right to vote and to do so on equal terms. Uh, the court held that the, that the maps had the intent and the effect of classifying voters uh, based on their partisan voting history, and that that was an equal protection violation. Uh, of course, unless that, that uh, classification serves a compelling governmental interest. Uh, and, and finally, the, the court declared that under the North Carolina Constitution, partisan gerrymandering unconstitutionally burdens free speech and the assembly rights of those who vote for disfavored, uh, for the disfavored party by diluting their votes and their ability to effectively organize. Um, so the court looked at a number of things and, and found that plainly and clearly the, the maps were drawn with the intent of favoring one party over the other, and they were found, and they found that they were effective in doing so. So 
in, in gerrymandering, especially on the state legislative level, one thing that you one thing that you'll see when you look at the way that the maps are constructed and the different scenarios and statewide vote share that may be uh, that that may happen in, from one election to the other, you'll see that it's not necessarily just a gerrymander to maintain a majority in both chambers, but sometimes can be a gerrymander so significant that it's to maintain a supermajority, uh, and also makes it very difficult for the other party to ever achieve a, a majority or to ever achieve a, a supermajority. So in North Carolina, for for um, for several years, there was a supermajority. Republicans maintained a supermajority in the in the North Carolina legislature, gave them the General Assembly, and gave them the ability to override the governor's veto. the The remedial process that took place after that ruling in Common Cause v. Lewis um, required that the the General Assembly conduct the redistricting process in an open and transparent way and actually led to all of the redistricting process being conducted in an open on camera everyone could watch uh setting and it it also you know required that they were not allowed to use partisan data in constructing the maps and uh and of course we're not allowed to use uh racial data some of the some of the districts that were uh that were uh, redrawn had to had to work around districts that had been redrawn by a special master following the the federal court ruling that uh, certain districts in the state constituted uh, uh, racial gerrymanders. So the the common cause v. Lewis opinion ultimately gave teeth to the free elections clause uh, under the North Carolina Constitution and was later applied by a set of voter plaintiffs to the congressional map. And that's how we got to the place where in North Carolina right now, we have a more evenly divided congressional delegation relative to the 10-3 delegation that we had for the, uh, for the majority of the decade. Um, of course, now there will be a new redistricting process. So in many states, and as it's supposed to be, the redistricting process happens once a decade. But in North Carolina, it happened a half a dozen times or more. Um, so it will happen again now. And um, with the new population numbers, you know, one of the things that we have to wait to see is the actual growth in the cities and in the counties and in areas that, that are thought to be hard to count census areas. Um, so those, uh, those, um, that analysis will, will take some time once, once uh, states actually receive that data in August or September, like I said, and the results of that, uh, the release of that data will determine uh, kind of the population growth and the decline in areas of the state and, and will then instruct uh, where districts will have to gain and lose uh, represent, uh, uh, voters. And, um, and also will kind of determine the proper placement of the new congressional district that the state has gained. And of course, it's a contentious process with uh, everyone kind of having their own opinion on what is best for a congressional map. But North Carolina is a relatively evenly divided state. So when you uh, have a map that doesn't reflect the even divide of the state, um, it, it should raise questions. So, you know, hopefully this, this redistricting process will be open and transparent and will reflect uh, will produce maps that reflect the will of the of the voters. Thank you, Matt. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. And uh, Don Vaughn also. We have a question that is a pressing question from a, an audience member. And I have some thoughts on it too, but I'll let you guys go first. Do you believe that we will have the Greensboro City elections this November? interesting that you ask. I was talking with folk down at the General Assembly today. The uh, Greensboro City elections will go as scheduled. There's no question anymore. The, uh, uh, the That was from Dan Blue, who is the leader over on the Democratic side. He said, we're not going to touch them. And one, one of the chief Republican 
consultant says they're not going to touch them. So the elections will go on as scheduled. That's what I heard today directly from uh, the room where it's happening down in uh, on Jones Street in Raleigh. I can add just a little bit of additional detail from that room also. Um, thank you. Uh, it's a big room. Um, yeah, um, and it's very consistent and nonpartisan. Um, it's, it's well, it looks like both Republicans and the Democrats agree on this. Uh, if I'm, I'm reading what I'm reading correctly, that the um, Republicans are unlikely to approve requests from municipal governments to delay. Um, and that the Senate minority leader, Dan Blue, uh, will support holding municipal elections on the regular schedule in September, October, and November of this year. Um, the, the legislature will grant local governments likely an extension to redraw their municipal districts so that the districts will take effect in the 2023 elections. The legislature will blame COVID-19 and the delay in block data from the Census Bureau as the reason. So Matt, you might address block data and what they mean by that if you could, and if not, I'll ask another question. Sure, no, so, so many municipalities and especially even states, New Jersey and Virginia also hold uh, legislative elections in odd numbered years. So Virginia and New Jersey are both moving forward with their legislative elections uh, based on districts that were drawn with the 2010 census data. New Jersey actually moved uh, to, to put forward a constitutional amendment that was approved by the voters to amend their constitution to allow if the data is received after a certain date that the elections move forward. Uh, but the block level data is the data that I was talking about uh, that will be received in August or September. So the, that's the data that's necessary to draw new lines that are equally populated. Uh, so the, the reason that there, that there are questions about these municipal elections is the concern that the current districts may not reflect the population growth and decline in the, uh, in the different districts and that as a result, some districts may have more people in them than they should otherwise based on the new 2020 uh, census data. It's certainly a difficult and unprecedented uh, situation that a lot of localities are, are in to, uh, to address the delay that to a large extent is not, is not really their fault, but also trying to fulfill the requirement that the districts be equally populated and that new elections be held. So this is just something that I find interesting. Um, Dr. Thomas Hoffeller, who drew the last legislative maps, is now deceased. What's going to be the practical, uh, how, how's this practically going to get done? The practicalities of the redrawing once the data is all in. I know we may be speculating, but and we're not going That's to- That's a Matt Minger question right there. Yeah. Well, I, I surely don't know what the Thomas Hoffler was responsible for drawing uh, state legislative and congressional districts around the country uh, with the you know purpose of serving uh, certain political ends, and uh, you know he was kind of instructed uh, to draw districts in certain ways. Many of the districts that he did draw were found to be uh, racial or partisan gerrymanders uh, in violation of state and federal. Uh, laws. The, the uh, reality is, is that um, the, the state in North Carolina has uh, the ability to draw the districts on their own without the help of an outside uh, redistrictor. The state has a demographer. And, um, and, when, the, and when the state drew the remedial uh, lines, the lines that were used in the 2022 elections, or the 2020 elections, pardon me, uh, Thomas Hoffler was not involved in in that process, and it was done open to the public with uh, legislators drawing the lines with the assistance of legislative set staff uh, on on legislative computers. So you know, states sometimes will 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 hire people to draw um, lines in the case of such as in the case of uh, Thomas Hoffler, but um, I'm sure that that. Um, that, that they will be able to draw the new lines without him. 
So talking just a little bit more about Common Cause versus Lewis, that was a three judge panel in Wake County Superior Court that ruled 28 of the districts drawn in North Carolina were drawn unconstitutionally. And after that, we also have Covington versus North Carolina, which was in the middle district. It was a federal case in our own home district here in Greensboro um, that was summarily affirmed by the United States Supreme Court. So for the lawyers out there that are looking for additional reading, the two cases that you want to read for sure are this Common Cause versus Lewis and Covington versus North Carolina. Um, Ruco versus Common Cause was the earlier Supreme Court case. And Matt, you might just give us a little bit of history on Ruco versus Common Cause. Right. I'm so, so Rucho v. Common Cause was the case that challenged the, uh, the, the congressional map that was redrawn after the federal court found that the, the old congressional map had, was, a part of, was a racial, found it to be a racial gerrymander. And the Rucho v. Common Cause ultimately went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court uh, decided that uh, partisan gerrymandering claims presented uh, political questions that were beyond the reach of the federal judiciary. Uh, in that opinion, they specifically noted that some states have constitutional provisions or state statutes that may allow state courts to adjudicate those claims, as we saw in North Carolina shortly following uh, the decision in Rucho. Uh, and North Carolina does have uh, greater protections on the right to vote in terms of the, the free elections clause uh, that says all elections shall be free. Uh, we, we don't have that in the United States Constitution, and kind of as a result, the, the court determined in a five to four decision that, uh, that, that there was no basis that they could adjudicate uh, the partisan gerrymandering claims. Of course, there is you know, work to, to put forward statutory requirements for redistricting, um, federal statutory requirements for redistricting that could change uh, you know, some of the reality around the, um, the decision in Rucho, but it was, a, it was an unfortunate decision, in my opinion, uh, and as a result, uh, made it more difficult for voters to, uh, to, uh, to file suit to protect their right to vote in federal court on the basis of being sorted and cracked and packed on the basis of their political voting history or preferences. Let me just ask, Matt, shouldn't we just have an independent redistricting commission and take the politics out of it and go with the lines, go with the population. Shouldn't we have one of those? Yeah, so a lot of states have moved to implement independent uh, redistricting commissions in an effort to kind of move uh, uh, the, the process away from politicians picking their own voters. Uh, California and Colorado, Arizona, Michigan, they all have implemented these, um, these independent commissions. One of the things that's different in uh, several states that have been able to do that uh, that's different than North Carolina is the ability for voters to collect signatures and put a constitutional amendment on the ballot. In North Carolina, for that to happen, the legislature would have to put forward and initiate a constitutional amendment, uh, which, which they, they do not seem interested in doing. Um, but it's my personal belief that independent commissions and taking uh, you know, some of the political influences out of the process uh, allow for the maps to better reflect uh, the voters and uh, for, for uh, kind of take some of the, the political, uh, you know, inclination to decide who, who may be voting for you and how the, how, and predetermine the outcome of the maps. Uh, when you have a nonpartisan independent body doing that, they may be less interested in the specific outcomes of specific districts. Senator Devon, this is a question for you. In your slide presentation, you had several kind of unusual, well, surprising or unusual referendums or things that may be going on, such as horse racing, marijuana, uh, casinos, and all of that. What's the motivation and who are the motivators, if you know, behind those kind of agendas? Um, is it money? It is money. Imagine that. It's revenue sources. 
and they seem to be individual legislators like in horse racing that want the revenue for their area casinos revenue for that area look what cherokee has done i don't know if y'all been up to cherokee lately but from when i used to go as a boy scout to cherokee and now it's like night and day everyone up there has a job it is a big economic driver up there. You can't get a room on the weekends and they're building hotels right and left. So I think it's individual legislators in particular areas that are driving that. I don't see that what we used to have, we used to be called the Bible Belt. I do not see those forces getting out like they used to. That's been my observation. And so you have the casinos, the horse racing, the, the sins that are out there. And this session may be the sin session that's coming in between marijuana and, and casinos and horse racing and other things. It's going to be interesting to watch. Now we're at crossover right now, which is halftime. And who, who knows who's going to win the full length game at the end. But as someone that watches this type of thing, it's an interesting year. So another question for you, Senator Vaughn. So, um, where would these new casinos, is there any thought on where they might go? Well, the federal government said that uh, Indian tribes can have casinos. Right. And these are in, on Indian tribes, but are state regulated. We regulate if you can have a, uh, your blackjack player is a machine or your blackjack player is a live person. State government regulates that state government regulates alcohol on that. There are no free drinks up at Cherokee. You have to buy your drinks. Goodness only knows what this legislature will do there. The next place that is talking about is the Lumbee Indians and in near Lumberton to have a casino there. It may be something, a trend that we see. When Virginia got the one that's right across the line in Danville, North Carolina took notice because the revenue because our folk will go up there to spend North Carolina dollars. And I think that sort of started all this. So if you're against the casinos, you're gonna blame Virginia for starting that casino up there. If you're, on, if you're on the other side, you'll probably go up and gamble a little bit up in Danville and then head right down to uh, Cleveland County, to Kings Mountain, and go to that new casino that opens July 1, amazing. So one question along the lines of these, the same topics, hemp, um, has the hemp movement inspired the marijuana movement or do you think those are separate? I think they're separate. It, 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 it's, it's hard to get high off rope and those products and hemp and marijuana, you know, it's a different part of the leaf. Uh, hemp was passed by the legislature a couple of, uh, sessions ago and it's highly regulated. Uh, though the, um, the hemp producers who started all the different hemp remedies have really not done that well. A lot of those have failed. And I know uh, we that have been in banking thought, gosh, this would be a great thing to fund. It's gonna make a lot of money. It has not. So that's yet to be seen. That'll be further regulated in, uh, in the second half of the legislature. I was thinking they might be able to use the same farmland and it's just the, the TCH content, um, but the farmlands are already plowed, set up, and all of that for hemp. That might be something that simply can be converted to. I'm sure some of these folks, particularly in eastern North Carolina, have already thought that through and we'll see that in the second half of the legislative session. Because I know that we've got some family lawyers out there, there were no family law initiatives uh, in your top 10. Um, is that because, and I have seen even out of one of our local uh, senators, some uh, proposed legislation that would shorten the length of time in getting an absolute divorce um, and some other initiatives like that. Have those just got no power to move on the train through the legislature, given the financial issues that apparently are driving with things like casinos and horse racing and marijuana. A lot of that's gonna depend on the, 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 the two guys I put on the slide, the Speaker of the House and, uh, and Senator Berger is gonna depend on what they want to do in this. They control their bodies. 
uh, uh, and uh, too, too early to tell you, you know, every year shortening divorce has been a bill in the legislature. Will this be the time that it does? It's been, uh, I remember 25, 30 years ago, we've always wanted to do in line with what other states do. Uh, and it always seems to come up. Will it happen? I don't know. But uh, domestic law is not one of the top biggies like guns and violence and infrastructure and other things. Vitally important to, uh, to everybody, but not one of the top 10 lists. So here's one that's uh, very interesting and important. What about online gambling? And then I'll have one for you coming up, Matt. What about online gambling? Many states such as Virginia have approved online gambling and add to that doing it with Bitcoin. Complicated issue. Hasn't Bitcoin taken off? When I first saw the Bitcoin thing, I thought those people were crazy. Crazy <laughs> like a fox. It has taken off. And, uh, but uh, and online, uh, online gambling can certainly be something that's thrown into the mix. Um, uh, too early to tell. Okay, this is from an old uh, a CPA friend of mine, Edward uh, Fiddleman. I hope you don't mind me saying your name, Matt. Nonpartisan independent commissions sound like something almost impossible to accomplish. Commission members, however selected, probably belong to some party and their independence level would seem to be very speculative because they probably belong to a party or lean toward a party. How do we deal with this? Thank you for that question, Ed. Yeah, no, it's a good question. And the, the approach that states have taken uh, to, to dealing with that reality has varied from state to state. Um, you know, most of the states that have these independent redistricting commissions have vetting processes and, and divide the, the members. They'll have Democratic members and Republican members, and they'll also have independent members as well, or members that are not affiliated with either of the two major parties. And in addition to that, the, in these, uh, these amendments that have amended the Constitution to provide for uh, these commissions, they've also, uh, they've also added to that some pretty significant criteria that the that the commission must follow and in most cases they they um they ban the consideration of uh you know incumbents or particular political parties uh under law so the the commissions are are um are kind of bound by more stringent criteria than than a state legislature that that really may only have to equal uh population and make sure the districts are contiguous or compact or that county boundaries are, you know, split as few number of times as possible. The criteria is kind of what gives key to some of that, to some of that reform. So it would seem like to me that it might be more neutral if the people as a whole could watch the process and it be videotaped as they're doing it or be broadcast live. And somewhere, and I don't remember where, did I read that um, that is what will happen, that it will be, they will be in a room and it will be like a workshop from city council. It's going to be broadcast and you can sign in on your computer and watch it. I'm gonna let Matt tackle um, that one. Yeah, I'm having some uh, some computer difficulties, so I don't know if you can you can see me, but I could hear the question, so I'll try to I'll try to answer it. It's it's not a hundred percent clear what the uh, what the legislature is going to do uh, this this go around. Um, I think that transparency and uh, you know public input in the process, of course, is uh, is helpful. But beyond just uh, just the process. Also, the you know the result is important to ensure that the the maps are reflective of the um, the will of the voters. So you know certainly encourage uh, a more open and we will wait for Matt to process and to, uh, to include so we have about uh, sixty. We have about two minutes left. And if you have your final questions, go ahead and put them in now. Don't forget to put your bar number in the chat box. I do need those if you want to have a supply for credit. 
So I'll let um, each of you have 60 seconds to sum up and then we'll bid everyone adieu and thank everyone for their attendance. Karen, let me just thank you for, for hosting this. The more we know about legislative process, the more we know about redistricting, the better citizens that we are. Uh, this is timely from the perspective of the legislature because it's half time right now. And it's a, a good time to sit back, see what is there. And if someone has an opinion, call the number that was on the screen. You can just go Google North Carolina General Assembly, see who your representatives are and how to have an effect on it. You know, if you wait till the last minute, you don't have an effect and it end up uh, like sausage being made down in the General Assembly. You don't really want to see it. The, the, the more notice you have, the better it is. And we thank you for putting this on. You're welcome. Matt, would you have a, like to have a few final words? Sure. I, I hope that my audio at least is back. But, um, you know, the, the maps that will be drawn over, you know, the net before the 22 elections will likely uh, determine, um, you know, representation and people's uh, political influence for the next decade. Uh, so, you know, the process is very important and I uh, encourage all of you to follow, follow along and please, uh, please feel free to reach out if you have any specific questions about uh, North Carolina's process or any of the, any of the litigation history or, or, uh, or the redistricting processes in other, other states as well. I'd like to thank also Judy Rasabi, who has been running the te uh, technological things for today and running this through a Zoom webinar program. Thank you, Judy. And many thanks to the Senator Don Vaughn and to Matthew Mengert. Great job, gentlemen, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Carolyn.